story goes that Pope Benedictus XI had been hearing about a hot new artist from Florence named Giotto. So he summoned a courier, that's what they called DMs back then, and told him to find Giotto and ask him to send in a sample of his work. When the messenger found Giotto, he related the Pope's message. Giotto took a piece of paper and a pen with red ink, and with a flick of his wrist drew a single perfect red circle. Here's your sample for the Pope, he told the courier. The messenger said, I am so fired if I give this to the Pope, but Giotto said, it is enough and too much. Just to be safe, the courier visited a few other artists and got samples from them to give to the Pope as well. Upon his return, the messenger presented the samples to the Pope, and Benedictus was said to have plucked Giotto's circle from the batch and proclaimed Giotto to have surpassed all other artists of his time. Luckily, we do not need the genius of Giotto to draw a perfect circle. In this video, I'll show you how to create grease pencil circles and ellipses using Python. We'll be building on what I've shown in previous videos in this series, so if you haven't done so, you might want to check those out first. First, let's set up Blender so we can start coding. Launch Blender in 2D animation mode, split the view, set the right view up as a text editor, and create a new text file. In my last video, I showed how to add strokes to the selected grease pencil object, so we'll reuse that code. But to recap, we'll import the BPY library, get the selected object, and do some simple validation checks. We'll also fetch our layer and frame objects. And lastly, we'll create a new stroke. Just like before, we'll need to add the number of points we want in our stroke. When drawing a circle, the number of points will determine how smooth the circle appears to be. Blender only draws straight lines between points, so we'll need at least 24 points in our stroke to give the illusion of a smooth curve. We'll start by adding a variable to hold the number of points we'll need. Then we'll use the strokes points.add function to add that number of points to the circle. To draw a circle procedurally, we need to set the center point of the circle, determine what our radius will be, and then define the points along the circumference of the circle. For now, we'll assume that the center point of our circle is at the origin, and that our radius has a value of one unit. We'll come back to these items shortly, but first let's take a look at the trickier bit, determining where to place our points. To simplify the problem, let's look at just the vertical position of each point. By mathematical convention, we start drawing the circle in the rightmost point of the circle, and work our way around counterclockwise. Since our radius is assumed to be 1, we draw our first point one unit to the right of the origin with a vertical or z position of 0. If we highlight just the z position of our points, we can see that they increase in value until their z position reaches one unit at the top of the circle. This makes sense because our circle has a radius of one unit. If we continue plotting our points to the halfway point of our circle, we see that the z position has returned back to 0. From here, our points sweep down to negative one unit and back up to zero to complete the circle. By focusing on just the z values, we can see a pattern start to emerge. The values seem to be spaced relatively far apart at the sides, but bunch up more at the top and the bottom of the circle. If we plot out the height of our points so that we move to the right over time, a pattern starts to emerge, which may look familiar to you as the Hubble sine wave. Plotting out the horizontal positions in the same way, we see that it too is a sine wave. It's identical in shape, but if we overlay it with the height curve, we can see that it's offset by about a quarter of a wavelength. All this goes to say that if we can generate a sine wave pattern, we can generate a circle. Thankfully, there's a function in the math library that can help us with this, appropriately called sin. Well, not sin. It's short for sine function and we can use the sine function to generate our circle. The sine function comes to us from the world of trigonometry, and yes, that's math about triangles, but it turns out that triangles and circles have a lot in common. If you nest a right triangle inside a circle, one of the points of the triangle will always be on the outer circumference of the circle. This is where the sine function comes in. Without getting too far into the math, the sine function says that if we have an angle and a length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle, we can determine the length of the opposite side of the triangle. If we know the length of that side, we can know the height of our point on the circle. The sine function in the math library assumes that the hypotenuse of our triangle is one unit, so all we need to do is figure out the inner angle of the triangle. This is relatively easy to determine, 
We simply divide up the number of degrees in a circle by the number of points in our circle to get the angle per point. You'll often see this angle in math books described with the Greek symbol theta, which looks like a zero with a horizontal line through it. This is just a mathy way of saying an angle of some value. In coding, this makes it quite simple. The sine function takes a single argument, which is an angle, and it returns a value between negative 1 and 1. We can then use that value to drive the z position of our point. But there's one gotcha with the sine function. Our input angle must be specified in a unit of angular measurement called radians. And to find out what that is, we need to do a teensy bit more math. In our everyday life, we tend to use degrees for describing angles, where we divide a circle into 360 degrees. But in mathematics, it's more convenient to use a different unit of measurements for angles called radians. Radians are based on the mathematical definition for the circumference of a circle. And for those of you who slipped through this part of geometry class, that's 2 pi r. You'll probably recognize pi as the mathematical constant with a value of approximately 3.14, and the r stands for radius. Our circle, conveniently enough, has a radius of 1, which means that the circumference of our circle is 2 pi, or about 6.28 and some change. In mathematics, radians are often referred to in multiples of pi, and since there are two pi radius in a circle circumference, there are two pi radians in a circle. That means that 180 degrees is just pi, 90 degrees is half pi, and so on. From there, it's relatively easy to work out the radians for anywhere on the circle. It's just some fraction of two pi. We now know that we can generate our point's z position by feeding the angle in radians to our sine function. This leaves us with the problem of how to generate the x position. And of course, there's a function for that called cos. OK, well, maybe that's not so ominous sounding, but it's short for another trigonometry function called cosine. The cosine function behaves almost identically to the sine function in that it generates a sine wave that can oscillate between 1 and negative 1. But the sine wave is 90 degrees out of phase. This is because the cosine of an angle gives us the length of the adjacent leg of the triangle, which we can use to infer the x position of our point. Now that we've waded through the math, let's put it into action in our code. First, we must work out how many radians are in each wedge of our circle. This is relatively simple. Since we know there are 2 pi radians in a full circle, the distance between two points is 2 pi divided by the total number of points. Since pi is an irrational number, using an explicit value for pi would make our calculations less accurate. So we'll import the pi constant from the math library, which will give us more precision. While we're at it, we'll also import the sine and cosine functions from the math library. Now that we know the number of radians required for each point, we can use that step value as a multiplier. In our code, we do that by setting up a for loop that counts through our points using an iterating variable i for each point until we reach the total number of points. For each point, we'll multiply i times the step value to generate an angle in radians. For our x position, we use the cosine function and pass in our angle. We can leave the y value at 0 since we're not really using it, and we can use the sine of the angle variable for the z position. The variable i specifies the index on the point list so that we're stepping through each point in the stroke and setting its position using the .co attribute. This attribute takes a three-atom tuple to specify the points x, y, and z positions. That's it. Let's see what happens. So close. But this makes sense. By default, Blender creates all strokes as open strokes, so it doesn't bother to connect the last point back to the first. Thankfully, this is an easy fix. We simply set the strokes use cyclic attribute to true. This tells Blender to close the stroke. Now we have a perfect circle. If we change the number of points to 48, it looks even more perfecter. Oh, perfect. Now that we can draw a basic circle, we can circle back around, no pun intended, to specify the radius and center point of our circle. Let's start by defining a new variable for the radius with a default value of 1. Since our circle has a radius value of 1, it makes it easy to scale the radius. We simply multiply the values that come from the sine and cosine functions by the radius we want. Now if we change the radius value in our code, the circle scale changes as well. Easy peasy. Setting the center point of our circle is similarly straightforward. 
The position of each point in our circle is being defined at a specific position based on the sine functions. To adjust the center point, we need to add an offset to the point's position on both the x and z axes. To do that, we can define a new variable for the center and assign it a tuple which represents our 3D position. For now, we'll leave these values at the origin. Further down in our code, we'll add the x value to the point's position we've already computed, and the same with z. At this point, we'd expect the circle not to change, so let's try offsetting the x and z values by 0.5. Our circle is now offset by half a unit in both directions. To make this code a bit more useful, let's wrap it up in a function called circle. Our function will take the grease pencil frame as its first parameter, followed by a variable for the center, which will be a tuple, and a radius, and then the number of points. We'll move our code into the function and have it return the stroke. And then we'll add a call to the function and test it out. The final order of business is to figure out how to generate an ellipse. Thankfully, this is fairly trivial. We simply split our radius variable into two variables, radius x and radius z. Then where we multiply the radius by the sine and cosine values, we'll make the same change. Just to be concise, we'll change the name of our function to ellipse since technically speaking, a circle is a subset of an ellipse. That is, a circle is just an ellipse with equal radius values. So that's it. We can now generate circles with nothing more than Python, Blender, and a little bit of math. Being able to generate circles with code opens up a wide range of possibilities, including stars, spirals, and other shapes, which we'll look at in the next video. But in the meantime, let's embrace our circular logic and go make us some circles. Thanks for watching.